Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Greg Lindsay, your moderator, Connected Mobility Initiative, New Cities Foundation. Hi, all. welcome to the session. I guess it's up to me to introduce my panelists who will be joining us uh, one by one. Sitting to my immediate right will be Aaron Landry, who's the general manager of Cartago North America. Come on down. <laughs> Seated to his right, I believe, will be Christoph Vernug, who is the CEO of EV Box from Amsterdam, I believe. <laughs> to his right is Dan Curtin, who's the vice president of fleet and supply chain at Zipcar. And last and tallest at the very end is Jay Walder, CEO of Motivate. <laughs> this is not the first time I've been on a panel full of gentlemen uh, talking transportation. Hopefully it will be the last, but, but thank you all so much for joining us. Um, the one thing we can't get into in this discussion, because otherwise we would subject the audience to multiple hours of autonomous cars. So we are going to discuss everything but that, I think, and even then we'll still hint at it at the end. But um, to me, it's really interesting on this panel because when I give talks about sort of the evolution of, of urban mobility over the last, say, 100 years, it's really interesting that from between the period roughly, I don't know, let's say the post-war era until about the year 2000, you know, we dismantled streetcar systems we d or, and we underinvested in public transit in America and completely standardized around, pr around private automobile ownership. And then circa 2000, I believe, or I forget exactly when Zipcar was founded, but Robin Chase, you know, of course, the founder of Zipcar had the idea, the initial idea of mobility as a service that, you know, that you could, you know, simply have access to cars instead of having to own one. And then, of course, that was followed by really the creation of Paris Philippe, the first municipal bike sharing program, which then spread to the United States with Capital Bike Share in 2010, and now Motivate is a major player in that. And then, of course, you know, car sharing evolved beyond the centralized uh, fleet model of Zipcar towards uh, a free floating car sharing, which is car to go. And now, of course, we're seeing the wave of electrification, which is further along in Europe. So I feel like we're, this, is, this is the last 15 years of urban mobility transformation is represented on this panel, and at least we can get into some of where this is going before it involves cars driving themselves. Um, so with that, I guess, I don't know, I want to start with a question, I think, uh, where to start? I guess I want to start with the whole question about, you know, let's think about parking. We were discussing a lot about parking. We were discussing a lot about how do you make the case in cities to the governments and to their citizens about the fact that streetscape and curbside and curb use goes beyond more than simply private automobile ownership. There are other public policy directives you can you can set and you can use that space for. And, and it becomes a question of how do you value that space? How do you invest in it? You know, the city giving over land and rights and the ability to use it in exchange for adding value. And then, of course, making the case to often angry citizens that, you know, that, you know, curbside parking is not your God-given right. And in fact, there's better things we can do with it. So I don't know if someone wants to go first on this. This is a little less of an issue for Zipcar in this, I suppose, but perhaps coming very, very soon. But, uh, but I don't know, I, I, I perhaps a place with Jay to start on this because, you know, you've witnessed, uh, here in New York, some of the battles over, you know, parking, sta parking stations, even Park Slope, where they turned into fervent, you know, uh, uh, individual rightists uh, when it comes to taking their parking spaces. The, the, certainly, uh, certainly have been battles, uh, although I think they're actually decreasing. And I think what, toward the point you're making, I think as you are showing the utility that people are seeing, um, the advocates and the people who want the services there are actually becoming a stronger voice in the public discussion. And I think you saw that, um, you know, even in the Park Slope case recently in, in doing it. But look, I think if you step back from it, um, if we, you took a long path in terms of saying, tracing the history of urban transportation, the fact of the matter is that I don't know a time until recently where we really have ever had a discussion about curb space as a valuable asset. Um, I mean, we're, I actually think that where, where we're moving into is a model where that space along the curb may in fact be the most valuable asset. And now we have to ask ourselves how we want to use it, how we want to allocate it, how we want to regulate it. And we have to do it in a way that is conscious of the fact that there are enormous claims on that and many, many uses. And I, I don't think that's going to be easy. I think it's going to be one of the most challenging things that cities have to do as we go to hit the vision that I think many of the people on this panel would, would actually put forth. Yeah. I, yeah, I would also add to that too, we're beginning to realize now just how expensive that, that curbside space is. You know, cities in the Northeast, cities that have four seasons, you have to plow it, you have to clean it, 
you have to repave it, you have to dig it up and, and, and repave it again. And it's, it's not cheap, it's not cheap at all. Um, and if everybody's gonna pay for those spaces, it seems that it's just for those few that, for the most part, at least from my experience, a lot of that curbside space is car storage, not car parking. It's you, you saw the bills for shoveling out my bike stations in March, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, we high. have to shovel out <laughs> thousands of cars at a time, and yeah, it, it gets expensive. It's not cheap. Aaron, please. Um, I, I think a lot of people uh, here know how Car2Go works, um, but if you don't, in, in, in brief, it's a point-to-point -point service where in most cities that we operate in, you use uh, curbside space, and it's a free-floating model, meaning you can park at anywhere on the street. So we work with municipalities to work at, uh, to park at meters. If your city has residential zones, we work with them to be able to park at residential zones. Um, and so initially, you know, years ago when Cardigo was starting out, I mean, the conversation that we would have with the municipality is like, how do we pay you or how do we agree to allow our vehicles to do this crazy thing? And now we've been able to prove that in cities where Cardigo is, um, people, it, it helps people have fewer cars overall in a municipality. And another thing about our model that we've been able to prove is when a vehicle leaves its space, that, ve that space is not only just available to the next person who wants to use it, but the moment that our vehicle is parked, it's immediately available for another person to use. So it ends up being a much more efficient use of curbside space. And so now that we've been able to, you know, now that we're a much more mature company, we've been able to look at things that way, and we, the, the value proposition that we provide to cities is much different than we were before. Christoph, obviously this is different from you, uh, for you, obviously because you're not supplying curb space, but, uh, but it is interesting in the sense well, of... It has a certain uh, impact. Well, yeah, you're, I mean, you're borrowing from cities. I, I, I bring up a quick story where I was in the UK a couple weeks ago, and when I was there, there was a think tank paper that came out that said even six cars charging could cause localized brownouts because the grid was so under-equipped to handle electric vehicles. So in your case, you're basically, you're providing electric charging spots from cities. You're building out the private infrastructure in exchange for having access to that. So how do you work out those sort of public-private relationships with cities? Yeah, I mean, uh, Amsterdam is a nice case. I mean, our, head, our company, VBOX, is headquartered in Amsterdam. Sometimes I say that we have the unfair advantage that we started the business in the Netherlands because it's the most developed EV charging country in the world, more developed than even California, or Norway, whatever. Um, and at our headquarters in Amsterdam, when you land at the airport, you get out, you only see electric taxis. Uh, you go into the city, and every street you're going to see uh, charging infrastructure. And actually, if you want to drive, your, if you want to have a parking spot in the, in the city, uh, when you live there, it takes you an average two to three years to get a, a permit. But if you drive an electric car, it takes you two to three weeks. And people have to charge in the street, so the charging infrastructure is used by people owning a car, but also by people sharing a car. car to go is a huge success in, in, uh, in the Netherlands and in Europe. And in, in Amsterdam, for example, it's all electric cars. Uh, all those uh, cars are charging every day on our stations all over the city and every street. And, and so it's a way of, 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 uh, of um, living that as of January next year, I mean, no uh, fossil fuel uh, taxis are loaded in the city anymore. It's going to be completely uh, zero emission. And it's a way of thinking and behaving with renewable energy, solar, wind, uh, storage. It's all part of a total ecosystem. Well, I don't think I'm this is a great question, and also pointing out electrification and car to go. And I'm curious, like, what are the what are the public policy goals of your companies? I mean, is it ever is it fair to say that everyone on this panel wants to basically reduce private automobile ownership in a way and reduce vehicle miles traveled? I'm sort of curious, like, what kind of policy goals are we setting for this? Because it's interesting. I think the the official framing for this panel was a question about whether your services compete with transit, which I think is interesting because they sort of do in the sense I've seen studies by Susan Shaheen, for example, about. Um, you know, that capital bike share, for example, replaces bus and train trips on short routes. But she's also I, done studies showing that, you know, Zipcar and Car2Go also reduce private automobile ownership, too. So I, I don't think we compete with transit. We are part of the transit system. Yeah. I mean, why, why, are we, why in the world would we say that bike share is competing with transit? It's, it is part of it. It's people choosing a, a mode, a, a way to be able to get around. They're, they're doing what fits for their purpose. Um, in New York City, uh, where, where City Bike has been so successful, 40% um, or so of trips actually start or end somewhere near, near the transit system. That's terrific. In San Francisco, we're launching in, in, uh, in a couple of months, Ford Go Bike, uh, the, the clipper card is the token of, of 
public transit in San Francisco, you will use a clipper card to unlock a bike. And, and I think we should be thinking about, you know, the distinctions about what the word transit means are frankly becoming outdated. And, and I, I think it's our not a competition. gives people the opportunity to use transit more. I mean, our main competitor since the day I was with Zipcar, since I started, is really urban, urban car ownership. Yeah. So we're trying to get cars off the road. We're trying to get those curbside spaces freed up for, for better use. Um, and our members tell us year after year when we survey them that they take transit more, they walk more, they bike share more. Um, so I, I think it enhances um, urban transportation and, and helps people use transit a little bit more. Yeah, in, in Europe, um, I mean, uh, the tax system on salaries is different. So you pay high taxes on salaries. And to avoid that or to compensate that, many companies are actually offering a lease car uh, to their employees. And that was, was the, the habit in the past. What you see now, the transition is really going, the move towards mobility as a service, whereby instead of having a lease car, you get a pass or a certain budget a month that you can spend on car, car to go electric uh, cars in car sharing, but you can also spend it on the tram, metro, bus, uh, bikes, and that kind of stuff. So as you need, as long as it's sustainable, um, that's, that's the way that, that companies are pushing their, their employees, their staff to go more towards sustainable solutions. And, uh, and also towards more uh, electric vehicles. Uh, that's definitely a move that is going on. Uh, let me just say one other footnote. I mean, as you know, I ran the MTA, so I'm, I'm hard pressed to say anything bad about our public transit system, and I don't want to say anything in that way. But the reality is that cities are more and more important in our society. They are not just becoming denser, they're becoming more complex. The patterns of travel, are, are fundamentally more complex than we ever saw before. This is no longer the Don Draper era of, of symmetrical trips that are, that are, that are taking place to and, to and fro. Um, the fact of the matter is we must embrace non-traditional means to be able to get around our cities. That's the only way that we're going to be able to keep up with the patterns of development that are taking place. And you know, I love one of my, some of my favorite stories are stories where people tell me that they now live or work in a neighborhood that they could not have imagined being in before City Bike was there. How about that, right? And, and you know, that's the way we have to think about it. But again, that's, that's basically saying it's a mobility ecosystem, and this is part of that ecosystem. We have to get away from these distinctions. Well, well yeah, go ahead. I mean, uh, to add on to a couple of those points, it, the. I mean, again, the, the common enemy really is the personal vehicle ownership in urban areas, like exactly what you said. Um, and then the, the transit, like it, competing against transit is, is not the right path long term for any city because the like good public transit is, should be really the backbone of a city. And, and, and yeah, does that include bike share, include other modes? I mean, I mean, you, we can talk about the definition, um, but in the end, you can't move the same amount of people that you can with all of these other alternative modes. Like, so with MTA, for example, I mean, it's like, what, 7 million some people a day on and the subway, and then six two Six on point, the subway and four on the bus, 10 yeah, million people. Yeah, four on the bus, not four million people. And it's like, it doesn't matter how, what the future looks like in terms of autonomous vehicles or how close or how connected these other vehicles are, you're not gonna move that amount of people in that time. And so you have to have these other modes to fill in the, all of these other gaps and not uh, not replace it and uh, competing against it would only have like short-term gains and long-term uh, long-term is not good for cities well we don't we don't have a right we don't have a ride hailing rep on this particular panel so I guess I'll have to put this out there but since you mentioned you know that uh, you know the shared villain here is the private auto, the private automobile um, I would I'm sure I know Uber's public policy team would agree that, that is their shared enemy as well but for those of you who get deep into transportation wonkery, Bruce Schaller, who was the deputy uh, uh, commissioner of transportation here under both Bloomberg and I think briefly under de Blasio, put out a recent report arguing with data uh, that you know, the Uber and Lyft have added in the last two years 50,000 vehicles for ride hailing, that they have added an additional 600 million vehicle miles traveled to New York City streets, which is congesting the streets, which is causing buses to slow, 
Um, you know, perhaps correlated is the fact that the subway has just posted a decline in ridership. The MTA seems to be buckling under its own success. Um, so, you know, how do we avoid the externalities? Even though, even though the, you know, that is also a victory over private automobile, um, I'm curious how all of you work with cities to avoid perverse outcomes in the sort of usage of this, or how should cities be working with these new private mobility services, yourselves and others, to basically reach these shared goals? I know this comes up, for example, we were discussing about like equity. You know, in Seattle, Car2Go has worked out deals with, the, with Seattle and Washington, D.C. to make sure coverage is provided equitably. So there's sort of an agreement on this is the shared public policy goal. How should cities work together with, with companies like yours to achieve these sort of mutually beneficial ends? Uh, so one of the things that we do when we work with cities is, is to understand how people move, uh, obviously, around a city, but also how to properly serve different types of communities. And one of the biggest focuses, I mean, obviously, equity is a, is a major part of it, but one of the biggest focuses is the car ownership angle and identifying neighborhoods where people are just on the verge of having one fewer vehicle and making sure that we're able to serve those c communities. Um, so uh, t we, we can talk about data later, but for example, there's bike share data that's usually available in a lot of North American cities that have bike share. And um, we can look at that data and kind of predict like what areas are people going to have fewer or, or want, may want to have one fewer car in a household or ultimately to go car free. And that's, I mean, we use that kind of data and that kind of a relationship with governments to influence some of our decisions. And then on our back end, we also have a lot of predictive analysis that goes on in terms of trying to understand where vehicles are going to be at certain times, where vehicles are going to uh, probably end up. And it kind of ties into the question or the thing that you made about um, how s some services end up uh, you know, filling the streets with vehicles that are either circling around or in, I, I come from Washington, D.C., where they do, they just do U-turns in the middle of the street sometimes, or they sit in bar bike lanes and fall asleep. Um, but, I mean, our cars are parked, and we work with the city to have them parked, and then we work to make sure that they are moved immediately by the next member that wants to use them. So that's, that's the kind of relationship that um, we forge with our municipalities. Um, and so it's, it's difficult when you see all these other options that um, may end up having some of those negative impacts, like you said. Sorry, I'm the only European in the panel, so I, I'm going to make a bold Tell statement. Tell us about this magical land where everything is different. I'm going to make a bold statement. I do not agree that, that the private ownership of a car is the enemy. I think the enemy is Chevron and Shell, fossil fuel cars. We should, the city should start thinking about the problems of about air pollution. And if, if you know, in, in New York, 35% of the kids have asthma problems. So air pollution sh should be one of the top priorities and getting, I mean, clean uh, mobility uh, solutions. That, that is taken care of. That's the time that things are changing here. I mean, in, in, in the Netherlands, if you visit a company at an office park or a company park, it's rather the exception when you see a company that doesn't have charging infrastructure, infrastructure in front of the door for guests, for employees, for staff. Here in the States, you don't find it. Even in Silicon Valley, I was there two weeks ago, it's hard to find charging infrastructure there. I mean, it's am amazing. It's, uh, Unbelievable. We cannot understand it. Well, I hate to break it to you, but you're in a country now where the head of ExxonMobil runs the State Department, so I'm not sure the government would agree with you on that. Uh, you know, uh, but James. Well, look, I think we, you. I, I think that point's incredibly well taken, but I think we have two different issues that we're, we, and we have to solve both of them, and that we may not solve them with one fell swoop. When the congestion pricing system was implemented in London uh, in, in 2002, that one of the things that, that was there at that time was that, that you could come into the congestion zone for free if you had a low emission vehicle in, in doing that. Now the reality is that that was a means of trying to foster uh, getting low emission people to make choices toward, toward low emission vehicles, but it actually was the wrong public, public policy objective in terms of congestion. And, 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 and I think we have to take both of these separate. I completely agree on the point that you know, we need, if we, could, if we could magically snap our fingers, and it, it won't take a lot, but, and, and change the fleet, and if we knew that tomorrow morning, we would still have a congestion problem uh, in, in many cities. I think where we, we have to get to uh, is that we have to reimagine the, the landscape of our cities above ground. We have to be willing to make priorities. Um, you know, cities are making choices in terms of bike lanes, for example, that have been hugely valuable in, in, in allowing safe biking to take place. We have to make choices in, in allowing our public transit vehicles to be able to move more easily and seamlessly through the city so that they're not back, backed up in doing it. And we may have to make choices in terms of pricing the roadway network in a more sophisticated way than, than a city like London ha has done. 
I don't think we're going to get away from that. At the same time, we have to make investment to be able to ensure that the vehicles that are there are in fact the, not contributing to source pollution and are, are efficient and, and environmentally friendly. And we, but we have to attack both of those problems. All right, well, let's, let's say, well, here's two questions for the panel then about whether you're willing to go on the record with both of these. Do we need, uh, should there be standard, let's say universal road pricing? You know, obviously London went ahead with that. City cons is creating an ultra low emission zone, partly to address electrification. They're thinking about whether they could actually sell politically to sort of broader road pricing of this. But there seems to be a whole lot of discussion again. You know, New York thinking about bringing back congestion pricing. Uh, and it comes up an idea. So, you know, should we have road pricing, particularly when we get autonomous vehicles? That strikes me as a big question. And the second one is, is you know, should we ban the internal combustion engine from the hearts of cities? Uh, the Germans want to phase it out by 2030. Paris is already doing car-free days. We're seeing a lot of cities in, in, in Europe banning it from the central, central business districts. So, you know, question for each of you. Should we have road pricing and should we be banning at least the internal combustion engine from the hearts of cities. It may be a little bit easier if you just think about all of these cars, whether they're combustion engine cars or electric cars, are coming into the city to do something. They need a place to park. If there's no place to park, if there's an apartment building where that surface lot used to be, if parking, like it was in, in Sydney, Australia, where it was there for a couple of years, is $1,200 a month, then you're not gonna, you're not gonna bring your car in. There's, there's, no place, there's no place reasonable to leave it there and that gets you back into transit, it gets you back into other modes of transportation, and then it starts to speak to what's, what's the suite of options that you have? Is there a car to go in the city? You know, is there bike share? Is there a zip car? Um, and I think that may be the key. Now, how fast we get there, I mean, it really depends on how fast the cities are developing, um, but I think at the end of the day, it really has a lot to do with where you're going with that car, where are you gonna leave it when, when you come into the city? Yep. I'll hang out there. We should absolutely have road pricing uh, without any doubt at all. You know, the fact of the matter is the idea, any, any idea that the streets are a public good and that one person's use of that street is not affecting someone else's use of the street is fundamentally wrong. Um, what prevented us from doing it was that we could not have a toll booth on every corner. It was not easy to do. Even the technology that we used in London 15 years ago was, was you know, a bit rudimentary in doing it. There is clearly no reason why we can't do it today. And I think we have to get over that, that hurdle and we have to start to think about it in that way. And I think some of the proxies that we have used whether it's parking and the type of taxing structure we have around parking garages, whether it's bridge and tunnel tolls or other things like that, frankly are less effective than if we sat down and really worked and said we're going to have a thoughtful road pricing system that really dynamically prices roads consistent with the way they're being used and allows us to be able to establish priorities for what we value. And, and I think we should be able to establish our values and say this is what we value and price it accordingly. Christoph, thoughts on electrification, particularly the arc of how that's gonna go in European cities that have thought about this, about banning either cars or, or you know, at least internal combustion vehicles from city centers. I mean, is this, is this a trend that has legs? Is it simply political signaling? How do you think that's going to, to happen? Um, well, actually at the beginning, um, the role of the government and the municipalities is important because I mean, the success of Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Utrecht and other places, Paris, etc. wouldn't be there today if the government and municipalities would have taken the first steps initially to make the, the, the investment in the infrastructure. Today it's already different. It's a chicken and an egg story. If you don't have infrastructure, people are hesitating to buy an EV car or to drive electric and so they don't do it. Uh, now it's getting better with the ranges that are getting better. But I mean initially that's needed and today in Europe we already passed in certain countries or cities that, that phase where it's already becoming a profit center. I mean, the law, if you see today the management of, of the, or the operation of, of uh, the city of Amsterdam, it's a profit center, the, the city gets paid to, uh, to give the license for a number of years and, and we operate it in a profitable way. So, uh, because there is enough volume transaction going on already. If you look to what the city is working on now, it's the next steps, it's, it's where parking lots will become huge battery uh, storage uh, areas where um, in the street uh, parking lots, uh, parking sp space will be reduced and will go towards uh, wireless uh, charging uh, as the next. It's, it's all that ecosystem of, of uh, renewable energy, but it's, it's not only electric cars, it's also the commercial cars, everything, but also total mobility. I mean, it's a combination of, I mean, uh, public transport, train, tram, bus, uh, the bikes, everything combined 
uh, on a more sustainable way to, to actually solve that uh, sustainable uh, issue because at the end, today, the polluter is not paying. I mean, the taxpayer is paying for everything. And, and, and so we have to make step-by-step -step, uh, improvements there. Great. Well, I want to come back to some of the discussions we're having about transit as well in this. I mean, it's, it was interesting. One, I'm, one evolution uh, of transit in your services is the whole concept of mobility as a service, right? There's the examples, for example, for those of you who are not, again, deep in the wonkery of this, uh, uh, WIM in Helsinki and also in parts of England launched with a whole new model for basically provisioning mobility, which is imagining something closer to your monthly cell phone bill. So instead of a data plan, a voice plan, and a text plan, you would have a transit plan, a bike sharing plan, and a car sharing plan attached to it, which you would pay for basically monthly subscription fees. Um, trying to bring together public and private providers uh, on the same platform. Um, and a number of other European cities have tried, Vienna and Hanover and several others of this. Um, so I'm curious, you know, uh, you know, to what extent various companies up here are participating in this. I know, for example, in Portland is a, is a, is a smaller version of this where their TriMet app uh, brings together on the same app that you would use to buy a, a tram ticket, you'd also could sign up for Car2Go or you could sign up for Lyft. Um, Xerox is hoping to do something similar in LA and Denver. So I'd be curious, you know, anyone up here, your experiences in working with these platforms and how effective you think they could be of, you know, this one ring to rule them all, a single app that I could use to go from A to B, provisioning my way across any number of private providers. Um, you know, to date, Uber has not participated uh, in, in, in any of these. Lyft is uh, in the TriMet app and is working with Xerox. Um, and you know, I think Zipcar actually is, is in Xerox's app, if I remember correctly. So I'm curious, you know, what your experiences have been, and, and what it, if not, what it would take for you to, to join such a service or be part of it? Anyone? I mean, from our perspective, um, we're happy to, to, to join in with anybody to make urban transportation a little bit easier. Um, you know, obviously providing different options for folks, keeping folks on the same platform uh, and being able to seamlessly go back and forth is really, is really one of the keys to it, I think. Uh, this is something we've been experimenting with quite a bit and we also, very similar to uh, most bike share programs, we have an open API where you can, uh, so, so any app that has that kind of aggregation function, um, you can see where City Bike or in, in my town's Capital Bike Share, um, and the docks and how full they are, and then what car to go are nearby. Um, and then, I mean, to use Capital Bike Share, you have to physically go up to it, and then you can also reserve it from, uh, from, from that app. So we're, we are experiment, experiment, experimenting with those types of things. Um, and then, yeah, one of our uh, partners under uh, our roof is um, also the company that is working with TriMet in Portland um, to try to integrate as many services as possible there. Um, and then another one of our counterparts, Moveable in, uh, in, in Europe is doing a lot of the same, same stuff, but uh, in their own path. And lo lots of different ideas happening at once. In Europe, it's already the case in many years. I mean, not yeah. only through an app, but also, I mean, instead of paying, filling up your car with a credit card or whatever, you, you have a, a mobility card with which you, you can uh, fill up your car, but you can also charge a car, you can buy your train tickets, uh, jump on a bus. I mean, it's all part of the mobility solution. It's, Brennan it's, was doing it 25 normal. years ago, yeah. Well, you know, well um, they, they, there are some funny things that stand in the way of this. By the way, we, we're obviously, because we do the bike share, we do have open APIs, we're all in favor of this. But there are some funny things that stand in the way of this. Um, we have federal tax policy in, in this country which says that you can buy through uh, your employer, your, the uh, pre-tax uh, benefits, you can buy your, your transit pass, but you can't buy bike share with that. Um, you don't have the ability to be able to cut across modes. And so if you're, you know, and, and where the, some of those lines are being drawn, the way that those things are happening, actually get in the way of some of what you're talking about right now. Because if you, because you really want to be agnostic about the way that you're using the, the modes for what fits what you need, as opposed to thinking about what actually fits around what, what card can I use to be able to do it, and am I actually paying an, an additional premium because I'm using post-tax dollars, pre-tax dollars, et cetera, and doing it. We have to get past some of these things. They're, they're just in the wrong place. In a, in a slightly similar vein, I'm curious about those of you who've worked with uh, private developers in this, right? So going back to some of the parking questions, I the punitive parking I thought was a, was a particularly interesting segue for this, which is, you know, uh, we've seen in Washington, D.C., for example, some local developers have worked to, to be exempted from parking minimums 
because parking is expensive, even for the developers. There's a great stat out of Seattle that, you know, that basically renters in Seattle pay $250 a month for parking spaces, whether they use them or not. That is simply the average of what you are paying for as part of the construction premiums on, on apartments. So if you want to build more affordable housing, you should be trying to eliminate parking. And some developers, as a way to do that, have worked out deals in DC and elsewhere uh, to where instead of building parking spaces, they basically give residents memberships in car to go, they give them memberships in capital bike share, they install transit screens, you see exactly what's happening here. And I'm curious if there's, you know, I, I know of a couple of these instances, but I'm curious if you've seen this taken even further, where, you know, electric charging stations in the basement become norm, et cetera, and we sort of move towards this whole different mobility model, or zip card memberships and, and credits being available to this, where we try to basically kill private, private car ownership because developers are motivated to kill the parking space because it'll help their buildings pencil out. So I don't know if anyone's seen some particularly interesting experiments in this area, but I'd love to hear where you think that might go. I think one of the very early days, very early partners of ours uh, in Boston were Harvard University and MIT. And what really motivated them were two things. Um, secondarily, it was to reduce the impact on the neighborhoods that they're in with people bringing their cars in. But more importantly, both schools were saving millions and millions of dollars on parking garages and parking spaces that they didn't have to build. And through the years, we've developed great relationships with, um, with developers to provide them, as you said, with, with free memberships or memberships that, part of your, that, that are part of your purchase price, cars that are parked downstairs uh, in a lim limited number of parking spaces. Um, but it gets back to the government, too, in that you know, they have to be willing to relieve these, these developers from having to build these expensive parking garages and underground parking in order to continue with, you know, the development of alternative transportation. And by the way, to complete that circle in the city of Cambridge, uh, Harvard and MIT have both sponsored bike stations, um, and they give discounts to all of their employees and, and students to become members of Hubway. So, so they actually are completing that circle in, in much the way you're talking about right now question is how you take it out of, you know, what, what are special kind of institutions and bring it into to an everyday development project. Christoph, let's leave you out on this. I'm curious, I mean, I know Tesla, for example, has tried to basically create its nationwide supercharger network as a way to basically propel adoption of its electric vehicles. I mean, obviously, this being the United States and this being particularly interesting administration in the United States when it comes to public infrastructure investment, which has called for, you know, a, a trillion dollars in private infrastructure. Um, how do you think we might actually see the rollout of, you know, an electric network here? Will it be through private developers installing it at their buildings as amenities? Will it be private companies creating proprietary networks? Um, how might you think we see to do that? Because here, for example, with broadband infrastructure, uh, in a rare case, that was not actually built by public money here. It was actually built by private telcos because they actually saw the business model in spending half a trillion dollars in building out broadband. So could we see that for electric infrastructure in the United States uh, to propel electric vehicle adoption? It's a good question. Um, th that's also one of the reasons that we are have investing heavily now to, to build out the business here in the U.S. because there is a, definitely a need for, uh, for uh, our solutions and approach. I mean, we do not believe in proprietary closed systems. I mean, uh, at the end, it's all about the end user, the consumer. I mean, that's the most important. You have to make it very convenient, efficient, cost effective for the end user. And if you work with a closed proprietary system, sooner or later the end user will be punished and, and will have to pay a premium price for it. So we are a true believer in open standards and we apply that uh, in Europe and we'll be, we are planning to do that also in the US. Um, and then in the US it's, it's slightly different than in Europe because you, ha you don't have today any public uh, charge infrastructure, so it's purely private. Uh, it's mostly uh, residential and workplace charging and commercials coming up more and more. But on the other hand, you see some uh, utility programs that are starting to push uh, new programs like PG&E in San Francisco and, and, and other places that will actually help adoption. We truly believe also that uh, Volkswagen is with Electrify America doing a great stuff in uh, building out that infrastructure in an open way, based on open standards, um, and we're happy to contribute to that as well. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done, but there is a huge potential. Um, and actually charging, I always say, it only takes two minutes if you look to a normal uh, AC charging. I mean, you just have to plug in your car and then you do other stuff that you like to do or that you would love to do. You, you work, you go to playing tennis or go to a restaurant, that's it. You, people. In Europe, you don't go to a, a fast charging uh, corridor because you have to wait in line before it's your turn and then 
that means that you already 20, 40 minutes are passed and then you have to go and supercharge in 20 minutes, it's too long. I mean, you leave your home in the morning with a full battery, you drive to your work, you charge, and, and you go to your sport club and restaurant where you can charge all the time where you're longer than a certain period. And that's the same with car to go in Amsterdam. I mean, they, they, those people are, all the users are charging everywhere where they find a spot all the time in the city. Uh, and they don't go, they don't go to a uh, level three fast charging station. It's not, it's not the way how it's working. Um, but there is a lot of work to be done and there's a huge shortage of infrastructure in the US. I mean, in, 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 in Europe, an average is one to three, one to five. Uh, I mean, number of cars to a charging station. In California, it's between one to 12, one to 18. So people start to fight even to be able to, to charge. So uh, lot of, lots of opportunities. Well, the discussion of public infrastructure there uh, ties back, I think, in a way to, you know, we talked about, you know, parking spaces and streets and private developers. How, are, how is this mobility revolution changing the look and feel and culture of cities? I mean, broader in the public realm. You know, in the past few years, for example, NACTO, the National Association of City Transport Officials, has released its own street designs, basically calling for what are called complete streets. And there seems to be this slowly growing recognition that the primacy of the automobile in the street, that the privately owned automobile owns the street in every way, is, is being slowly cut back, that we're creating more spaces in streets for things other than just the private automobile. Um, so I'm curious, you know, your, your thoughts on sort of, you know, where this is going, also changing the culture of that, because we also live in a place where cyclists still take their lives into their hands when they go out there, and there's still a culture where the motorist uh, is ultimately blameless in the case of accidents as well. There's you know, reluctance to basically charge motorists uh, in such incidents. So I'm curious what signs you've seen of this broader cultural shift of things like NACTO and Vision Zero and other sorts of, uh, other sorts of efforts to you know, reclaim streets for people versus than just for cars, only for cars. It, it's real. And, and look, I mean, I, I think New York is a great example of, of a city that's taken bold steps to be able to do that and, and reimagine spaces in the heart of the city that we could not have believed would, would be reimagined that, that way. Um, I think we watched a couple, we've watched a couple of things recently that, that are interesting, right? We watched um, real questions come up about whether or not those reimagined public spaces in Times Square would, would stay or would go. And, and again, interestingly, the public came out and said, no, we want this. Don't, don't think about taking that away. And, and that was great. Again, it, it showed that, that, that you can take the step and it becomes part of our culture and it becomes part of what we want to do. Uh, we were talking earlier, somebody was mentioning uh, they, they got off a train near Penn Station, I forget who, who said this before, got off a train near Penn Station, walked over to 6th Avenue, saw there was a bike lane there and went, wow, th there's a bike lane on, on 6th Avenue over, over, over here. Um, these things are real, they're happening and, and, and doing it. Can we do more? No doubt. Can we do it faster? No doubt. And, and are they creating conflicts and prioritization questions? No doubt. But I don't think we're walking away from it anymore. I think we are in the midst of that change. And we're going to stand up and we'll, we should be bold and continue to make those changes. And we may not get them all right, but that's okay too. You know, the, the world is urbanizing. Folks are moving back into the city. And no, you can't bring your car. There's not enough space for this. And I think from a culture perspective, people are beginning to understand, maybe that we didn't understand 30 years ago, what quality of life is like when you've got a 20 minute commute versus an hour and 20 minute commute, or the ability to be able to live and work in the same neighborhood. Um, it's, it's an amazing transformation. It'll, it'll take another couple of generations, I think. But I would agree, I think that's where we're going. It's it's the same thing with Me Too. So even though our model in most of the cities we operate in depends on curbside space for our vehicles to park, um, and my personal opinion, if somebody wants to uh, rip up that space and create a bike lane or create a park, whatever, that's perfect because that allows... That, that, that works for your business model. Because that works perfectly for us because that allows more people to think, oh, I don't need a car for everything, right? I could bike, I could walk, I can take transit, I can, I can do whatever. And then that... I mean, it, it, it's a little bit backwards, but that actually helps us because the bottom line is we want to be able to support cities in their efforts to make them great places to live. I mean, it's, it's, so any way that we can support making a city great, a greater place to live, even if it means taking away parking that would be for car to go, great. All right. Um, 
I thought you had an announcement you were making today, Aaron. Oh, uh, so today we also I knew announced there was something we were forgetting. Well, well, another thing that we do with a municipal, I mean, most of the municipalities in North America that we work in are also on uh, have Vision Zero announce or Vision Zero initiatives as well to uh, drive down to uh, zero per zero deaths on roadways, um, and so we uh, announced today. There's also a Vision Zero conference happening at the same time um, that we are going to be incentivizing our uh, members to take driving courses that we're going to pay for um, to help them become even better drivers. So we have a, a personal and a company and a municipal interest in making sure that our drivers are awesome and even better so. So we'll pay them to take additional driving courses. So that's, that's something that we're doing with Vision Zero and that's, that's announced actually just uh, about an hour ago. If you make them also sustainable afterwards, besides awesome, it's totally top. And uh, <laughs> we're working on, we're definitely working on that as well. Well, I would say the, the fact that you're offering driving lessons to members ma makes an interesting question, which we can then segue into the panel following from this is, which is it, it assumes then that you believe from a car to go perspective that humans will continue to drive and want to drive their own cars. You're not making a, are you making a big bet on autonomy on the side? And I'm curious if Car's thoughts on this is too, as two of the original sort of car sharing versus ride hailing versus autonomous vehicle manufacturers. You know, how, how long will humans stay in the loop in this? And, and you know, are, also, should we all go back to driving school so we can all drive in mixed use environments with AVs? Because that's not really working out in some of the uh, more publicized trials that are happening in cities around the country right now. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to talk about autonomous cars, but. I can't get away from it, man. I, I well, it's, it, it, everybody's, everybody's really hot to trot on those right now. And, you know, the one thing, that, the burning question I keep having is who's going to be able to afford this? Um, to me, I think right. the autonomous cars where, 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 where we're commuting to work again for 40 minutes in a single occupant car, it's not going to scale. I think what, what may scale when it comes to autonomous cars is the ability for the cars to be able to go fetch themselves the ability for your, you to be able to drop your car off um, you know, in the front of your apartment building and have it go park itself wherever it goes or have it go to the next member to share. I mean, that's the autonomous car that, that I'm looking for that, that's, that's going to change the landscape well before we have autonomous car traffic jams. It's only going to drive more sh car sharing. Huh? I mean, those, those type of solutions will drive more uh, people push, going towards uh, car sharing. It's, it's a positive uh, thing. Isn't it a beautiful thing? Yeah. And if they then use uh, wireless charging, it's totally top. All right, great. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. The bad news is that there's no time for audience Q&A. The good news is, is that through the app, you can harangue each individual speaker with as many questions as you like. So feel free to message all the gentlemen up there. And one final note, if you enjoyed this conversation, then I would encourage you to join, all of you to join us at the New Cities Foundation in Los Angeles this fall, where we're going to be hosting LA Commotion, our inaugural urban mobility festival, five days of conference and public demonstrations of all sorts of new emerging mobility technologies, which you can play with while you're there. So that's November 15th to the 19th in LA. So thank you all so much for coming. And now we'll get on with the autonomous vehicles after a short coffee break. Bad, you feel sodomized. Time for words to be 